This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at Apple's latest iPad, the iPad Mini. 7.9 inch display, 1024 by 768 resolution. Incredibly thin, thinnest tablet yet on the market. Good looking. Metal back. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the much rumored iPad Mini, and it has a 7.9 inch IPS display running at 1024 by 768 resolution. Now that's the same resolution as the iPad 2, which is still on sale for $399 from Apple, but you've got it squeezed down into almost two inches less space, so that makes for a higher pixel density and a sharper looking display. No, it's not a retina display. Apple couldn't get a retina display into this guy for the right price, and obviously the 7.9 inch size, but I'm really not feeling any pain for that, and we do have a Retina iPad around, I have a Retina Mac, and I'm still not looking at this and saying, ooh, it looks nasty. No, no, it looks, actually looks quite nice and quite sharp. So you can see there's almost no bezel around the sides here, so those of you who want to hold this as an e-reader, keep that in mind. You're going to be wrapping your hands mostly around the back side of this kind of wide-body tablet here, because there's not too much to hold on to there. That may be a consideration for some of you, and it's quite different from the Amazon Kindle Fire HD that has a very pronounced bezel to give you something to hold on to. So you can see my hand is stretched pretty wide, and I have a big hand, and that's because this is a 4 by 3 aspect ratio tablet, so it, it's not as tall and narrow as others, which makes for natural reading when it comes to books. It's a little bit easier to read the narrow, skinny column of text presentation you get on a 16 by 9 display but it also means you will get black bars in videos that are in widescreen format. However, Apple kind of fights this so that you're not feeling like other 7-inch tablets have an advantage over this because, well, this is almost an inch bigger than 8 inches, so you're still really looking at about the same size actual video playing. We measured this with the ruler using the same video on a couple of different devices in the 7-inch size category. It's available in either black or white, the same as with the new iPad and the newest new iPad usual black shiny bezel here, very thin, and the finish is like the new iPhone 5, which means it's that anodized aluminum finish, really gorgeous looking, 0.28 inches, it's so thin, it's freaky looking, it really does look like something out of a sci-fi movie, certainly not clunky, it just about disappears in terms of thickness on the table. If we take a look at the back again, the same finish that you would see on the iPhone if you get the black model, really nice looking. And they got that reflective little Apple logo there that lights up if the light hits it just the right way. Or you can get it with more of a, a silvery finish. Again, a white model or black model, it's your choice as to which is available. On the bottom here we have our new lightning connector. Just like the fourth generation iPad and the iPhone 5 comes with that cable. And it comes with the same charger that the iPhone comes with. So it's that little square block connector and it's not the bigger, chunkier adapter that you get with the larger iPad. And the speaker grills here, well, you know, Apple's been having two grills for a while, but only one of them actually was a speaker, the other one was a vent. These are actual stereo speakers, first time for Apple. Good times. Right here we have our 5 megapixel camera, not bad quality. I would put it as better than the iPhone 4, but not as good as the iPhone 5. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Up top on the corner here we have our little power button, sticks out just a little bit so you can feel it and find it, microphone hole up here, 3.5 millimeter audio jack there. And on this side we have our teeny weeny little volume controls and our combo function, you can use say for rotation lock on the side here, and that's about it. So gorgeous design, excellent materials, it feels like an expensive tablet, relatively speaking these days it is an expensive tablet compared to the Google Nexus 7, Android tablet, and Amazon Kindle Fire HD. Now those are two products that really are changing the market because they're so affordable at $199 starting price for the lowest storage capacity. And the reason that both Google and Amazon do that is because they want to make money on the content that you buy afterwards. Obviously with Amazon they're hoping you're going to shop for just about anything that Amazon sells, get an Amazon Prime membership, buy their books, pretty obvious. And even with Google, there's a whole lot of services and stuff that they make money off of if you use Google software products. So it, it's putting the pressure certainly on folks who focus primarily on putting out nice hardware like Apple, even Toshiba, and Asus. Now that said, of course, Apple does have the whole iTunes ecosystem. They're making some money there at that point, but they're really, they're fond of their high margins on hardware. And what does that see if that ever changes? But anyway, for the huge majority of people that still are seemingly in love with iPads and iPhones, none of that really matters. They just want to get whatever as Apple has made most recently. And well, for those of you who are 
like in the iPad, it's thinking it's a little bit big to carry around everywhere. That 10 inch footprint is just about like carrying a little netbook around. This might be the answer that you're looking for. And we're going to compare it to the new iPad now, which is the 9.7 inch model. Here we have the new iPad. Now that's become an ambiguous statement, hasn't it? Because we have, have two new iPads, the iPad 3rd gen and 4th gen. This one happens to be the 4th gen. Same as the iPad 3, uh, the original new iPad, except it has a faster CPU inside. But anyway, this is all about the size comparison. So for those of you who are wondering how they compare, considerably smaller, yes? So, more portable. You could just about do that. It's going to overlap a little on the width, but to give you an idea of how much more you can carry around, well, that guy's more portable. At the same time, given the big 4x3 aspect ratio and the 8 inch display, it feels pretty darn big. I'm surprised other reviewers haven't commented on this compared to 7 inch tablets that I can actually hold in one hand easily. I have to do a real palm stretch to hold onto this guy. But the, the nice part is, you don't feel as constricted. Sometimes with a 7 inch tablet, you feel like, well, I just wish it was a little bigger to read web pages more easily without zooming. I wish my videos looked a little bit bigger and filled the screen, and likewise with games. And it's amazing what an inch can do. This guy really starts to feel more like a tablet than, than a, a kind of oversized phone, shall we say. And portability is more than just the dimensions. The, the new iPad is 1.5 pounds versus 0.68 pounds for the iPad mini, so a lot less heavy as well. And believe me, you do feel that if you're holding either of these in your hands for a while, the, the, the new iPad is pretty hefty. This guy certainly is not. Now the back on the, on the black model, something like the iPhone, boy, it does show fingerprints. You can probably see we've been handling this for a while and there's a whole lot of, uh, well, schmutz. Now if we give it a wipe with our microfiber cloth, well, there's still a whole lot of schmutz. You really have to use a damp towel to get that clean. The, the silver version for the white iPad model, less so. Does this guy scratch as the, the black iPhone 5 is known to do? We haven't had any scratches yet. We'll let you know if that happens in our full written review. The iPad mini starts at 329 That's for the Wi-Fi only model with 16 gigs of storage. So that puts it a significantly cheaper than the new iPad, which is 500 bucks, 499 for the base storage model, Wi-Fi only. And it's still a little bit cheaper than the iPad 2, which is $399. Now, a lot of people think bigger is always better, so they're like, well, why wouldn't I get the iPad 2? Instead, it's bigger, it has the same CPU and all that kind of thing. Well, because some people want something that is smaller, lighter, easier to throw in their bag. Also, you get higher pixel density here, so you get a sharper looking screen compared to the iPad 2. Again, because that 1024 by 768 resolution is squeezed into a smaller IPS panel. If you want to go up in storage, Apple charges $100 free each increment, so that means a 32 gig is going to set you back 429 and a 64 gig will be 529. We'd like to see them start charging less for their upward storage increments. It used to be all the manufacturers followed suit and had that same pricing model, but a lot of them are dropping the price down because flash memory prices have gotten lower. But still, that is what it is. Now for those of you who want this with cellular service built in for data, that means you get 3G and you get 4G LTE. And it's available on AT&T, Sprint, or Verizon, your choice. That starts at for 59 so you're paying $130 extra for that cellular radio, and that carries through for each of the storage increments again. So let's do a little size comparison. We've got the Nexus 7 here, which is a 7-inch tablet. also has an IPS display, 1280 by 800 resolution, and you can see it's a little bit smaller. Certainly, it's mostly on the narrowness factor, and that's something you're going to notice if you hold it in one hand. Now in terms of thickness, the new iPad is significantly thinner and a bit lighter as well. And we'll have a separate smackdown between these two tablets, so if you want to know the ins and outs of each. And now we have the Amazon Kindle Fire HD right over here, and these guys are a lot closer in size. The Kindle Fire HD is thicker and a little bit heavier. Uh, teeny bit shorter, but the width is about the same, and, and the Kindle Fire HD is a 7-inch tablet. What it has is very large bezels, relatively speaking, for today's modern tablets, around the size, uh, sides, and that's because, well, it's the more space they have to work with, the less expensive they can make it. Miniaturization of components does cost money, and also to give you a place to grab and hold onto when you're reading and holding it like a book. Put them on top of each other. You can see the size is just about the same, just a little bit taller for the iPad, and from the side, the Kindle Fire is considerably thicker. But still, you know, neither the Nexus 7 nor the Kindle Fire HD are chunky, thick devices by any means. We're talking all slim devices, just that the iPad mini is so darn skinny.
So what do you get for your $329? You get everything that you would get on the regular size iPad. Same exact user interface. It comes with iOS 6. It upgrades to 6.01 out of the box. Your usual icon grid right here, your customizable shortcuts. Same applications are bundled on here. You've got Apple Maps now instead of Google Maps. We've got Contacts, Calendar, Game Center, the usual settings, and Magazine Stand, iTunes, of course, the App Store, Safari built in, the video player, music player. Nothing here is any different from the big iPads. So we're not going to go into in detail. They haven't changed the experience at all. The only thing that's different is it's just a little bit physically smaller version of it. In terms of performance, you're basically looking at iPad 2 level performance here. It has the same A5 CPU, clocked at 1 gigahertz. It has 512 megs of RAM. On Geekbench 2, it scored 747, which is pretty good. And that's pretty much the same score that we've seen on the iPad 2, lower than the latest generation new iPad, which scored around 1750 on Geekbench 2, but that one has the new A6 CPU, so certainly a lot more brains in there. That said, you know, I'm not feeling, oh, this is slow in any way. You know, Apple's iPad products and iPhones never are slow. And most of today's games, which are the most demanding apps out there, to be honest, 3D games, run just fine on this because there's a whole series of iPads out there that developers have to develop for iPad 1, iPad 2, and so on. So I, right now I've been playing some pretty demanding games, not feeling any lag with that. On Sun Spider, the JavaScript benchmark is scored 1541. Not bad. That's certainly behind the iPhone 5, though, that scored an amazing 922, where lower numbers are better. Browser market scored 121,353. Good score there. GL Benchmark 2.1, the Pro Test, 60 frames per second, very good. Egypt Off Screen, 90 frames per second, lovely. Egypt Standard, 60 frames per second. So, certainly not a slow device, even if it's not as fast as the Retina with the A6 CPU. So, the 4x3 aspect ratio and resolution that are the same as the traditional iPad 1, iPad 2, what does that get you? It gets you a pretty comfortable browsing experience. Here, right now, even using this in portrait mode, which is something I normally wouldn't do for web pages, text is teeny but it's readable. And I'm actually impressed with, relatively speaking, the clarity here for a non retina screen. It's really not hard to read at all, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of pixel jaggies. So, certainly, even a default zoom in portrait mode, that's not bad looking at all. And if we bring it up, it stays nice and sharp and clear. Easy enough on the eyes for me. Hey, maybe you have really great eyes, but it's working for me. Now if we put this in landscape mode, there we are at default zoom. So it, it's nice. It's easy to read. And I feel like I'm getting a little bit more on the screen thanks to that screen size. So it makes it feel more like a desktop -y experience. And now we brought our Nexus 7 back in so you can see the difference in the amount of stuff you're going to see on screen at default zoom. So you're getting a lot more on the iPad in terms of the height here. And also a little bit more, it really has to do with how the browser is fitting the page in, but it seems like a little bit more in the width, but pretty much in the height. It's great. When you're reading on the Nexus 7, and I love my Nexus 7, one thing I have to say is I'm constantly, if I'm reading in landscape mode, scrolling. It's just a relatively narrow band of stuff to work with. And now compared to the Kindle Fire HD right here, which actually, the way it does the layout, gets you a little bit more text to see compared to our Nexus 7 there. Still not as much as the iPad, so there you go. Nice, nice web browsing experience there. Reasonably clear text and a fairly white neutral background. You can see our Kindle Fire is a little bit warm, actually a little bit yellow in comparison. Now, as you might have heard, the YouTube player is no longer installed by default in iOS 6 on the iPhone 5 and it's not yet ready for the iPad. So you have to use your Safari browser to walk on over to YouTube yourself and you're going to get the YouTube mobile site here in HTML5 format video. We have no issues with HTML5 format video. It's more lightweight yet still just as good looking, but wouldn't mind that dedicated YouTube app coming back. But let's see how it does in terms of quality. And we'll take a look at the Microsoft Surface for a little competition here. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and this is the Microsoft those speakers. Surface RT tablet. This is running Windows 8 RT. And we'll talk about it works for me. Three looks CPU, nice. Good experience. And we're going to try out a cinematic widescreen movie. This is iTunes SD movie. You'll be able to see how much black bar there is, and we'll just skip forward a little bit. So as measured by the roller versus the Kindle Fire, we're actually getting the same amount of height here, despite the fact that this is 
letterbox and looking kind of small. Great speakers, I will say. Though, still the Kindle Fire HD really has the best speakers I've ever heard on a 7 inch tablet. Beats this guy by a little bit for volume and fullness, but this is quite good. And now we're going to try it on a 1080p trailer, MPEG-4. See how that size is up. Much less in the way a black bar is here, since it's not cinematic widescreen. Makes it fairly immersive, I have to say, for a fairly portable tablet. You were made to be ruled. I'll bring that volume down a little bit because it's so loud. So nice experience actually for watching 1080p content. Or 720p content at that because that, you're not going to get too much of that black bar thing going despite the 4x3 aspect ratio. And now we're in iBooks because, gosh, 4x3 aspect ratio is nice for web browsing in my opinion. It's also quite lovely for books. Speed is just fine. Text, nice and clear, too. You can see right here, and even though I have a fairly small font set, very readable, nice experience. Uh, I'm not feeling like, ooh, this is grainy or this is nasty by any means and wishing I had a retina display here. Nice. And now we're checking out the Nook application so you can see how that looks. Again, very nice, very readable, good speed. Also supports facing pages if you like, though on a screen this size I personally wouldn't go with the facing pages view because, well, you've got two teeny little blocks of text going there, but you can if you want to. And now we're in the camera application, which typical of Apple has very little going on visually. You can switch between your front and rear cameras over here between photos and video using these little controls. There's my shutter button. Quick picture of our little Sesame Street friend there. And our options basically just is... Show the grid or don't show the grid. Now the rear camera is 5 megapixel autofocus. Once again, it has a backside illuminated sensor. It has an f2.4 aperture lens, which is quite a large aperture, so it's good for low light photography. You can tap to focus if you want, and it has face detection as well. And the front video chat camera, the FaceTime camera as it's called, 1.2 megapixel, 720p video. Backside illuminated also an unusual feature for a front camera, and that means that you look pretty bright and pretty good. You don't look like your usual dim, grainy self that you might using some other tablets and smartphones on the market. And it supports geotagging. To round out the rest of the features, there's dual band Wi-Fi 802.11, ABGN, Bluetooth 4.0. Obviously, the two cameras, no GPS built in on the Wi-Fi only version. You'll need to get the one with cellular inside, but it can do location with Wi-Fi triangulation, and that's actually very effective if you live in an urban or a suburban area. It has a built-in 16.3 watt battery. Uh, Apple claims that it's good for up to about 10 hours of use on a charge, and so far with mixed use we're actually finding that's true, so it has quite good battery life. Again, it, uses, it ships with the iPhone charger, I should say. You could plug in your bigger iPad charger if you wanted to, but you're going to get that little teeny block style charger that comes with iPhones. And it has the usual digital compass, gyroscope, ambient light sensor, and obviously an accelerometer that handles things like screen rotation and uh, movement in gaming. Friend in our spider screen. So here we are, complete with water reflection, something that you get Integra 3 equipped Android tablets, but otherwise you miss out on. We'll see how this plays. Aiming around looks good. We're going to move up. And you don't have to worry about compatibility, because since this is the standard resolution that's used on the iPad 1 and iPad 2, it's already supported. It's not like the iPhone 5 where you have to wait for the updated size. All right, a pumpkin head. Happy Halloween. Frame range is staying good, even at close range fighting. So it's playing just great. And the screen feels pretty big. It feels like a real fun gaming experience. Not like I'm suffering from cut rate size here. So that's Dead Trigger on the iPad Mini. And now we're going to check out Modern Combat 3, another demanding game. This game has really good sound on this iPad, nice and full. The invading army is called KPR, the Korean Pack 
Pakistani and Russian alliance. As you'd expect, the cutscene plays just fine. Playing fine, we'll skip ahead. See who we can shoot. Playing perfectly well. And this is a very current game. So that's Modern Combat 3 on the iPad Mini. Plays great. So that's the iPad Mini, and yes, it is a smaller iPad. I mean, duh, I don't know why people say it's not just a smaller iPad. Obviously, this is a 7.9 inch iPad versus the 9.7 inch full size iPad. But that's a good thing because you get everything that an iPad can do right in here. More portable size, oh, almost one handed operation if you have big enough hands. Smaller price tag, not bad. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.